a study to do today. And so I would like you to take your Bibles, your notebooks, your pen, your marker, everything what you can. And we're going to do a Bible study. Without any further ado, I'd like to pray and begin. Shall we bow our heads? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your presence. We ask and we invite the presence of your spirit into our heart. If there is sin or presence of evil in our heart, in the unconfessed sin, may your spirit bring it to mind that we may confess by repentance right now as we open your word. We need your help. Please, dear God, bless us with your spirit and lead us into all truth. In Jesus' name, amen. In case you've forgotten, and I have not, we are continuing our study on the three angels' messages. Today is part 31. And the title of today's message is Worshipping the Beast. Worshipping the Beast. As you know, the previous presentations have focused on the first and the second message predominantly. And now we are dealing with the third message. The last few presentations were on the third message. But really, we are still in the introduction of the third angel's message. Open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14 contains one of the most serious warnings in all the Bible. The most serious warning in all the Bible can be found in Revelation chapter 14. You heard Elder Omeya read it. Let's read it again, which is the third angel's message. Revelation chapter 14, reading from verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Verse 11. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night. Who? Who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Now you may recall in the last presentation, we unpacked who the beast of the third angel's message really is. So we went back to Revelation chapter 13 and there are two beasts in Revelation 13. One arises from the sea and the other arises from the land. Who can tell me what the sea beast represents? Who? Who does the sea beast represent? Am I in the wrong? Am I in the right address? <laughs> yes. Rome, Roman Catholic papacy. And who does the land beast represent? The United States of America. Praise God. So, the second beast, which is the land beast, is going to help the first beast to accomplish its purposes, its plans. And so that's what we understood. But now, the third angel's message says, whoever worships the beast, which beast does it represent? It's still pointing to the first beast because the second beast is just an accomplice. It's just helping the first beast. So if you and I or anyone worship the beast which represents Roman Catholic papacy. I'm not talking about the church. There are some very good Christians in the Roman Catholic church. I'm talking about papacy. I'm talking about the leadership of the church. The organization, the worldwide system. If anyone worships the beast and his image will fall in the hands of God's wrath. And that's the most serious, austere, 
the most serious 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 warnings in all the bible and so today we are going to answer the next most important question what does it mean to worship the beast and his image let me ask you what do you think is going to be the final conflict all about what's going to be the final issue the final test worship praise god worship is going to be the final conflict the conflict between jesus and satan is is escalating and has been escalating throughout the ages it will reach its climax which is now and the final point of this controversy will be about again worship true worship versus false worship there is the true god and then there is the false god there is true worship and then there is false worship i want you to understand the moment we say worship there are four elements of worship and it equally applies to true worship as well as to false worship and i want you to listen carefully there are four elements connected with worship how many did i say four number 1 who or what we worship that's number 1 number 2 there is an image number 3 there is a name to what or who we worship and number 4 there is a mark did you get it there are four number 1 whom we worship number 2 whoever or whatever we wor- we worship has an image number 3 has a name and number 4 has a mark keep that in mind but we're going to come back to that later in the presentation but if you, if you if you read verse 11 of revelation 14 carefully all these four elements are found in that text so let's go back and read that text once again revelation chapter 14 and verse 11 see if you can find all four elements in that text revelation chapter 14 and verse 11 and by the way we are going to read too many verses so be quick with your bible revelation 14 and verse 11 and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast that's number 1 and his that's number 2 and whosoever receiveth the mark that's number 3 of his name that's number 4 did you get it there are four elements connected with worship so in order for us to understand what it means to worship the beast which is false worship we must first understand what is true worship i'm not going to spend an hour talking about worshiping the beast we need to understand what it means to worship god because that's the foundation that's where we need to begin and being that the conflict will be over worship we must dedicate enough time to discuss the foundation of worship now what is worship worship comes from two words worth and ship if you ask webster dictionary it defines the word worship like this to regard with great or extravagant respect honor or devotion or worship is to honor extravagant love and extreme submission did you catch that in other words to whatever or whomever you show extravagant love respect honor all adoration praise that is that very act is called worship let's read a verse 
Psalm 96 and verse 9. Psalm 96 and verse 9. A very well known text. It says how we must worship God. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. How must we worship God? In the beauty of holiness. What does that tell you? What is the beauty of holiness is? We worship God because he is holy. Because he is lovable. Because he is admirable. He is respectable. He is worthy of all praise. He is so awesome. He is loving. He is kind. He is merciful. He is good. This God that you and I worship is adorable. Sometimes when I hear someone looks at a little cute baby and they say, Oh, he is so adorable or, or she is so adorable. I cringe. Don't use that word for anyone or anything. Only God is adorable. Worship. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 and 5. Deuteronomy 6 verses 4 and 5 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. And how, was, how must we worship Him? How must we love Him? Verse 5 says, And thou shalt love the Lord your God with almost all your heart. With all your heart. With all your strength, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all what you are and what you have. Love him. Even if it is 99.9% .9 not accepted. God needs your entire heart, your entire life. With all your strength, worship God. Love him. There was an American writer called David Foster Wallace. He was not a Christian, but he wrote about worship. And this is what he says. I'm not going to read the entire two or three paragraphs, but I'm going to summarize. He says, in this day and age, or any day and age, there is no such thing as atheism. What is atheism? People who say that there's no God. And they don't believe in worship, right? He says, there's no such thing as atheism. Everyone worships something or someone. We are created in God's image. We are created to worship. It's either God or something else. And he says, everybody worships. There's no such thing as not worshipping. The only choice we get is what or whom we worship. The compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God or spiritual thing type to worship is pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. He's saying if you worship something that is not God, it's going to eat you alive. And he gives a few examples. If money is your God and if things and material is your object of worship, if they are where you tap real meaning of life, you will never feel enough. You will never feel satisfied. You will always want more money, more material. It's going to consume you. If beauty and body and sexual allure is your worship, then you will always feel ugly because we are all aging. If you worship power, you will end up feeling weak and afraid and you will need more power and more and more to numb your fear. If intellect is your object of worship, you can be smart, but you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always 
on the verge of being found out. Worship God and Him only. So the question is not whether or not to worship. The question is whom do you worship? The beast and his image or God? Why we worship God? Why do we worship God? If I ask you, what differentiates, and by the way, there are many gods, right? Small g, there are many gods. If I come from the land of India, and there are 330 million gods. I don't want to say their names from here, but they are pretty fascinating. How do we differentiate the true God, which is the God of heaven, from all the false pretenders? Let's go to the Bible. First Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 26. First Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 26 gives the answer. How the true God is differentiated from every other false gods. First Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 26. For all the gods of the people are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. It's a question. What's the difference? What's the difference between the true God and the false gods? God, the true God, made. He created. He is the creator. Everything else are created. Creatures. That's the only difference. The basic point, the common denominator, why we worship God is because he is the creator. Now, he is also our redeemer and we worship him because he is also our redeemer. But that's an added reason. Do you understand? We have at least two reasons to worship God. Because he is our creator and our redeemer. But the common reason why we worship God is because he is our creator. Let me explain. Do the angels in heaven worship God? Were they redeemed? No. So why do they worship God? Because God is their creator. Do you understand? So the common reason, the common denominator why we worship God and what makes him the true God is because he made. He is the creator. Jeremiah chapter 10 verses 10 through 12. Jeremiah chapter 10 verses 10 through 12. Note it down. Uh, or read with me. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God. And an everlasting king. At his wrath the earth shall tremble. And the nation shall not be able to abide his indignation. Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 11. Thus shall he say unto them. The gods. What? The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth. Even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. Verse 12. He that made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom. And hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. Is it clear? Amen? The true God is differentiated from all the false God because he is the creator. One more. Verse Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Not only did God create this earth, He also created the heaven. Nehemiah prays here, and in his prayer, He says, Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Why, Nehemiah? He answers, Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host. And all things that are therein. The seas and all that is therein. And thou preservest them all. And the host of heaven worshipeth you. Amen. 
And so God is the creator. And God, the true God is the only one who deserves worship. And what differentiates the true God from the false gods? Because he is the creator. And he has one sign, one memorial to show that he is the creator. And what is that? What is that? The Sabbath. The Sabbath is the sign, the memorial that he is the creator who made this world in six days and rested on the seventh and placed it as the seal. Now, coming to the most important question of this presentation. How to worship God. Now, oftentimes, this is not taught in the church. Neither is it taught by parents to children. Why? Because we don't know. How do you worship God? What is worship? If I were to point one of you and say, can you say how to worship? Will you say? How to worship God? There are a few things I want to say. This is a big topic, and I, I cannot exhaust this topic, but I want to give you a few glimpses, and I want to go to something very important. Okay? A few things on how to worship God. Turn with me to Psalm 95, verses 3 and 6. Psalm 95, 3 and 6. And these are some of the aspects of worship. Psalm 95, 3 and 6. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. Verse 6 says, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. Why do we worship God? Because he's our maker. How to worship God? What do you do when you worship God? You bow down. You lower yourself. And you kneel. This is one aspect of worship. Why do you bow down? Why do you kneel? When you bow down, which body part goes first? Down. Which body parts must go first down? Bow down. Your head. You know what does that mean? It represents you cannot come before God and say, I, I, I. Come on. It must, it must show your humility, your submission. And as you submit yourself to God, you are lifting him up. Your eye must go down. Your I and God cannot coexist. There is no room for two persons here. It's either you or God. You choose. It's either the beast or God. But many times we have tried to fit God into the little space of the big I. Mm, doesn't work. Bow down, let us kneel. Now, if you go through the Gospels, the word worship is not used as much as you might think. Mark and Luke, and by the way, Matthew and John use uh, the word worship for the most part. Mark and Luke use it sparingly, much lesser than Matthew and John. But I want to show something to you. Go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 2. Here, Jesus is born. And wise men from the east arrive at Jerusalem seeking to see this newborn child. You read in verse 2, Matthew chapter 2 and verse 2, saying, Where is he that is born, king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to do what? To worship him. And how are they going to worship? Let's read verse 11. Very good. 
Let's read verse 11 in the same chapter, Matthew 2. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. And what did they do? And fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. That's the other aspect of worship. The first aspect is you lower yourself down. You fall down prostrate. You kneel. The other aspect is when you come to worship God, you have to, can you come with, with empty hands? Huh? The God who has blessed you with life and health and so many blessings, you come to God with an empty hand? Come with gifts. They brought gifts. They treasure Tithes and offerings. Hello? Are you faithful? Are you generous? An act of worship is to give to God. So it's clear that there is some form of lowering self. The right posture that is seen and required when worshipping God. But it is still not very clear on how to worship God. You know, Satan understands and he has understood worship than anybody else other than God. I can tell you that, at least in this room. You say, how do you say? Turn two chapters later. Matthew chapter 4. This is the third temptation of Satan to Jesus. The third temptation. The first was about the stone into bread. The second was cast yourself. And the third temptation is this. We read from verse 8. Matthew chapter 4 reading from verse 8. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, All things will I give thee if you do this. And what should Jesus do? If thou will fall down and... Worship me. Did you get it? There is no worshipping God unless I goes down. Satan knows that. But you and I don't know. Fall down and worship. And by the way, when do we have to worship God? So we have to lower self only on the seventh day. Am I right? Come on. Be a Seventh-day Adventist. Only on the seventh day we should worship God. Am I right? So that means for how many days can I exist? Zero. Because we must worship God always. But there is in particular sense the seventh day. We're coming to that. How to worship God? The most clearest definition in the Bible is given in the book of John, chapter 4, by the words of Jesus himself. Turn your Bible to John, chapter 4. You know this story. This is the discourse between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. And, uh, and she is a battered, emotionally struggling woman she comes at 12 o'clock in the midday you know the story she has no friends she's humiliated she she's been with five husbands she's now living with the sixth who is not her husband she's living in sin and she's there at the well and jesus is before her at the well and jesus starts a conversation you know the story and at, at one point, Jesus says, says to her, call your husband. Oh, that when she gets nervous. And then she tries to fluctuate the topic and turn and deviate the topic to make it worship related. And she says, oh, oh, by the way, I see that you are a prophet. And then she says that our fathers, in verse 20, our fathers said that we must worship in this mountain. But you say that you must worship in that mountain in Jerusalem. Where is the location of worship? What did Jesus say? 
neither in this mountain nor in that mountain worship your father and where must worship begin it is not location dependent it begins in your heart where you are amen and then jesus continued to say verse 22 ye worship you don't know what you worship but we at least know whom we worship don't miss this point for salvation is of the jews and then verse 23 very important he says but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers jesus is defining who the true worshipers are and what is true worship listen carefully john 4 23 when the true worshipers shall worship the father in what in spirit and in truth for the father seeketh such to worship and jesus repeats himself the second time he says god is a spirit and they that worship him could should must it is a necessity how how to worship god in spirit and in truth it's not one of the two it's both ah when jesus said that something struck in her mind like a blow boom and she could speak no longer and she in her heart was almost convinced that this is the messiah but she was not she was afraid to ask that question are you the messiah but she says you know women speak in diabolic language they say something but they mean something else i'm coming to discover that after 12 years of marriage and she says to jesus yeah when the messiah comes he will tell us all that but she's actually asking are you the messiah and what does jesus say i am and don't miss this point you must true worship must be based on the spirit and the truth in other words we cannot claim to worship god and not be filled by his spirit we cannot worship God with a carnal mind. We need a spiritual mind. Amen? Now you can come to church and say, and sing aloud, and say, sing unto the Lord, and sing unto His name, and without the Spirit, all in vain. All in vain. There are many churches, you can go there, who can sing, who can dance, and who can do all kinds of things and say that they have the spirit but they do not practice the truth both in other words we cannot worship God we cannot claim to worship God by keeping the truth at the door what is the truth what is truth? John 17, 17, Jesus said, what is truth? Come on. If you answer quickly, we end quickly. Don't blame me for being late. What is truth? John 17, 17. Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. So whatever worship, the true worship must be based on the infilling of the spirit of God led by the spirit into truth and what is truth his word is truth so whatever however this word says god must be worshipped is the true worship amen more deeper psalm 119 verses 142 psalm 119 142 thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and thy law is truth his commandments are truth read verse 151 thou art near o lord and all thy commandments are truth so 
they can claim to say we have worshipped the God, our God in spirit. Oh, you must have come to Sabbath, uh, to church service this Sunday. We were filled with the spirit. Really? And you keep the truth at the door? And even the Seventh-day Adventist churches sometimes, we keep the truth at the door. We, we, don't, we, don't, we don't follow this, this word, this truth, this commandments. And we say, we have the audacity to say that we are true worshippers. True worship must be based on his law, which is found in his word, which is led by his spirit. Now let me ask you, so, true worship is based on the spirit and the truth. And we just said that the truth is his word and the law found in his word. So we have ten commandments. Now can you be more specific? Which of the ten commandments defines what true worship is? Come on up, be good Adventists. Which of the commandment defines what true worship is? What? Who said that? The first one? Okay. Any other answer? Everything. Okay, now we have three divisions, four divisions. Brother says fourth commandment. That is where we almost get it wrong. Do you know, the first table of the law, the two tables, the first table defines our duty to God. The second table defines our duty to one another. Now listen, watch carefully, listen carefully, don't come to conclusions right now. Listen to me. The first table, the first four commandments defines what True worship is. You say how? The first commandment says whom to worship. Even though it does not identify, it still says whom to worship. Thou shalt have no other gods. It disqualifies all other gods and says I am the only God. Okay? The second commandment says how to worship or how not to worship. That's bowing down to an image. No, no, no. The third commandment identifies what his name is and how to reverence it. And the fourth commandment says when to worship. All days, but particularly the seventh day. Now I want you to bring back to mind what I said in the beginning. How many elements are required for worship? Four. What did I say? Whom to worship? He has an image, he has a name, he has a mark. Let me ask you, false worship is based on these four things. Worshipping the beast, he has an image, he has a name, he has a mark. Then true worship must also be equal to that. So God has, he is, and now, he's, oh, where are you going with this? Does he have an image? God has an image. So, oh, whoa, whoa. This is blasphemy. Wait. Wait. God says, I have an image. Don't bow to any other image. And number three, when his image is formed in you, which is about the sixth, second commandment, then you and I are eligible to receive his name. And when that happens, finally is the Sabbath, and you and I will receive the mark, the stamp of authority, of God's authority. It says, the seal of God, this is mine. And that sister, that daughter is mine, and this one is mine. Amen? Sabbath is just an outward sign of worship. But something has to take place first on the inside. 
Let me tell you differently. If God is not first in your life, he is not in your life at all. Thou shall have no other gods before me. Period. If you, in the morning when you wake up, and you still have not opened your eyes, and you take this, and you respond to your Facebook and WhatsApp, this is your God. Truly, you don't believe me? Speak to your God first. Listen to his voice from his word first. If your priority is not to have his image, and by the way, let me clarify what his image is, because I said he has image. When God created Adam and Eve, did he, did he create in his image? Right? We know that, right? Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. Quickly go there to read. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27, because I don't want you to be confused. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. Actually, 26 and 27, but let's read 27. It says here, is 27? Yes. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So does God have an image? Yes. If God is to be worshipped, is his image part of worship? Come on, be bold. Yes. I'm not saying to make a statue or something like that, but you need to understand what this image is. Go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 and verses 14 and 15. Colossians chapter 1 gives you the answer of what this image of God is. Colossians chapter 1 verses 14. Actually, we should read from verse 13. Colossians 1, 13 to 15. Who is speaking of Jesus Christ? Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath transferred us into the kingdom of his what? Dear son. 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And then the word says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? So who is the image of God? Jesus Christ. Now tell me, can you worship God's image? When God created Adam and Eve, He put the character of Jesus in them. Image of God. Jesus, the character of God in them. And so the second commandment says, the first commandment says, I and no other. And the beast says, I am and no other. The second commandment says, Jesus must be praised. Jesus' character must be perfected. Must be conformed in this life. And don't bow down to any other image. But the beast says, no, 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 no. Keep Jesus aside. My image. And when God's image is perfected, formed, the, by the way, the verse for that is Romans 8.29. The, 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 the image of Jesus must be conformed, perfected in us. When that is done, we will receive his name. You know what is his name? Of course, his name is connected to his character. And it says here, if anyone takes his name in vain, you know what that is? If you call yourself a Christian and you go out and commit adultery, you are taking his name in vain. Because you are taking Christ's name. Have you not taken Christ's name? You are calling yourself a Christian. Christian is a follower of Christ. And a follower of Christ does not commit adultery. He does not live with someone who is not his spouse. He does not look at pornography. He does not lie. He does not steal. He does not disobey his parents and authority and leadership. He does not, she does not envy, jealousy, hatred, anger, all out. The character of Jesus 
is the ultimate. Obedience is the highest form of worship. When that is done, and you also keep the Sabbath, you receive the seal. Sabbath is an outward sign. So don't just be hung on Sabbath. By the way, don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not degrading Sabbath in any way. I'm just giving you the right perspective. You can call yourself a Sabbath keeper, but if you go around lying and stealing and mistreating and beating upon your wife, or speaking against your husband with all kinds of words and come to church and say, Hello, pastor, elder. No, that's false worship. False worshippers, me included. Let me tell you, We think that uh, we are Sabbath keepers. We know the truth. Yes, of course. Uh, when the beast comes and when the mark of the beast is enforced, we are not going to fall. Right? You be careful. What makes you think? When you are not keeping the Sabbath now, when you have not made it a priority to pray every day, when you have not made a priority to reflect Jesus and his character now when it is the time of peace, what makes you think that you will stand and reflect God's character and keep the Sabbath when it is enforced? Let me tell you something even further. If you have even a little bit of the beast's character, which is Satan's character, by the way, and you know all of Satan's character, you can read Galatians chapter 5. Variance, emulation, seditions, heresies, wrath, anger, malice, adultery, fornication. You name it. When a little bit of that is there in your heart. When that beast and his mark is enforced, you will automatically be attracted to the beast. Because your heart does not fully belong to God. Do you understand what is true worship? How to worship God? How to worship God? So don't beat about your chest and say, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. But ask God that his character will be perfected. His character will be formed. When somebody says something, you, you get that anger, that ego is, is preventing you from asking forgiveness. I see families, families, um, what do I say, that are tearing apart. Husband complains about wife and wife about children and children about parents. And the man is living with somebody else. What's going on? Who are you? You call yourself a child of God? And there are families under the attack of the devil. And by the way, we allow ourselves to be attacked by the devil. We put ourselves in vulnerable situation. And so I have to bring this to a close. The papacy, and so the papacy has made two changes in the law. One is about idolatry, which is the second commandment about image, and one is about the Sabbath. It has its own Bible, it has its own theology, and it has its own form of worship, which is not based on the spirit, not based on the truth. Period. And by the way, don't think that this message is only for the Roman Catholics or for the Protestant churches who have fallen and who have followed the beast. It's for you and me in the sense that we need to allow his spirit to lead us and to allow the spirit to form the character, the image of his son. 
have god supreme in your life my dear brothers and sisters ah to be a christian is a joyful experience it is fun filled i tell you it is fun filled i don't say this to boast i pray something and god answers that very day the god even if he doesn't answer fine he has a better plan he has a better plan walk with him hold him have jesus as the lord of your life it is so joyful enoch walked with god and ellen white writes ah he he did his duties to the world but he was constantly led by the spirit of christ he was under the influence of christ hold him christ is exciting he is so joyful he is awesome there is no temptation that can overtake you my dear friend when you have jesus in your heart i tell you so now you know what worshiping the beast is if you are not a true worshiper you are and i am a false worshiper and what's the true worshiper the one who worships him in spirit and in truth so if there is some area of your life that is not surrendered if you regard iniquity iniquity in your heart and pray the bible says even your prayer is what an abomination you see so if you have a sin that you know that you have long cherished but the spirit of god is speaking to you again and again and again but you will not surrender you are a false worshiper sorry and if i am in that category i am the papacy takes the place of god and by the way that is why the next three presentations will be about the image of the beast the name of the beast and the mark of the beast and satan knows this very well and he has counterfeited the first table of the law the first four commandments that has to do with worship how does somebody some of you may who may be think hearing this may say that well the papacy does not claim to occupy god's place on earth and maybe the third angel's message does not apply to it but is that objection true to the fact you know the papacy the roman catholic papacy occupies god's place on earth it has the titles that god only belongs to god it possesses the rights of god and exercises the power and functions of god second thessalonians chapter 2 verses 3 and 4 i think this is this is this this is the second last verse for today and there's one more verse and we close second thessalonians chapter 2 verses 3 and 4 paul is writing here you know this verse second thessalonians chapter 2 verses 3 and 4 don't let anyone deceive you in any way for that day will not come and he's talking about the second coming until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed the man doomed to destruction who's this man come on who's this man come on who who the papacy or in other words anti christ because later in the chapter he says anti christ which is none other than papacy again we're not talking about the church the roman catholic church we're talking about the headship of the church verse 4 he will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called god or is worshiped so that he sets himself up in god's temple proclaiming himself to be god now tell me does papacy claim to be god on earth how you know this this chapter says he is the anti christ anti christ comes from the greek word anti christos it does not mean against christ 
It's actually taking the place of Christ. Let me give an example. From the sanctuary services, the lambs were sacrificed for the sinners, right? And the lambs represented Christ. So the lamb was a type. Jesus was the anti-type. When Jesus came, the, the, the meaning of the type faded away. Okay? So here is Christ. And the papal system is anti-Christ. So they say, oh, we are here. And this, this type, this Christ, no value. Jesus said in, in Matthew 23, you don't have to turn there. He says, no man shall call any man father. But this system commands everyone to call him father, much less holy father. Mm. And by the way, one aspect of worship was what? Bowing down, right? To him. The papal system commands everyone to bow down to the pope. Did you know that? You can go to history and even now they kiss his ring. Have you seen that? taking his ring and kissing him. Earlier, in the 1260 days, they used to kiss the feet of the Pope. The temporal kings were to kiss the feet of the Pope and his ring, bowing down to God or to the beast. Number four, only God has the power to forgive sins. Does the papacy claim to have it, the power to forgive sins? You better believe. They say, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, by the way, I showed you a video uh, a few months back, the last time I think we were here. The Roman Catholic Church had a unique problem during the COVID period. A unique problem to Roman Catholics, which were the people complained, and the complaint finally reached the Pope, and the complaint was, Oh, our sins are too much and they are not forgiven because there is no priest in the church. And we are not allowed to go to the church, to confessionals. And so the Pope had to give a video message to all the worldwide Catholics. Have you seen that? And there he says, oh, I understand this is a problem, but I have a solution. Yes. What's the solution, Pope? And Pope Francis says, go to the Father. He will forgive you. Oh, what a discovery. And then he said, when the COVID is finished, come back to the priest and then your sins are forgiven. Hello? So, he's actually putting whom above? The priest above God. Isn't that taking God's place? infallible only God's word is infallible but the papal system says whatever the Pope speaks as ex cathedra which means that whatever the Pope speaks from sitting on his papal throne that is infallible that cannot be wrong is it only the Lord sets up and removes kings the papal system claims to have that authority and they say, we tell you who the king should be and who should not be. God is the supreme judge. But the papal system says, we judge. We judge who goes to heaven, who goes to hell. And some of you are in purgatory. And if you pay some money or if you do this or that, we have the power to send them to heaven or send them to hell. Ridiculous. In fact, uh, I read in a statement, they say that the Pope has even the authority to judge angels who might err in faith. And the Pope says that they can be excommunicated, the angels. Are you joking? And they claim, the papal system claims that the priest, an average priest, in the Roman Catholic Church is the creator of the creator. You say, how is that? Have you heard this word transubstantiation? 
every week mass is celebrated in the Roman Catholic Church and there they give the bread right and when the bread is given before the bread is given that round thing the priest prays over it and he says these words uh, hoc est corpus meum when he says that that's Italian and when he says that they claim the power of the priest is the power of the divine person for the transubstantiation of the bread requires as much power as the creation of the world. They claim when the priest says that words, the bread actually has become the body of Christ. So on the table, the priest has created the creator blasphemy worship God and him only do you know what is true worship if you and I are not filled by his spirit and live a life according to this there is no point in coming to church there is no point in claiming that we are Sabbath keepers there is no point in anything Ask for the Lord to guide you and to keep you from falling. I want to end with this last text. You know this story, is there any hope for me? Oh, this is so such a strong message. Is there hope for me? There is hope. There, there is a story in the Bible. Uh, you, you know this, the demoniac of Mark chapter 5, you know that? Jesus crosses the sea to heal that man and then and, and Satan was trying to keep Jesus from coming to that Gadara by bringing a storm in the sea. You know that story? What happens? This, this, this man was the most lost man. He was cutting himself with stones. He was chained and the chains he plucked off and he was a big nuisance to all the ten cities in that country. You can, you can read about this in Mark chapter 5. But later in the story, you find that this man was healed from all the demons by the way this man should have had at least 2,000 de demons 2,000 pigs were killed that day and by the way a legion army had about 4,000 5,000 soldiers at least 4,000 I think this was the most lost man in the world but Jesus came to rescue that man and in the, in the, in the last part of the story you find that when the people all came because their economy was disastered they saw this man sitting and clothed with his right mind at the feet of Jesus. What happens at the feet of Jesus? What happens at the feet of Jesus? Worship. You know what was the turning point? You know what was the turning point? You read that. Uh, Mark chapter 5 and verse 6. Mark chapter 5 and verse 6. Mark chapter 5 and verse 6. You know what was that turning point in this man's life? I'll tell you, this man was filled with the image of the devil. If you will, the image of the beast. Mark chapter 5 and verse 6. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. Amen? True worship was the turning point. Amen. He ran. This was this man who had the image of Satan fully. But when he saw Jesus, he worshipped him. And that changed his life. Are you willing to worship God? Do you want to commit his life to him? My dear friend, there is nothing that can satisfy you in this world except God. Don't think that I can live my life now and enjoy my life and still when the mark of the beast comes, I can... It's not possible. God is calling you now to live a life for Him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for speaking to us today through your word. Help us, O oh Lord, that we may allow your spirit to have his free course in our life. That we may be found in the group of true worshippers, worshipping you in spirit and in all the light and truth 
that your spirit has led us into. Please, dear God, if there's someone here who's struggling with a certain sin and has not surrendered or has surrendered and backslided, be gracious unto them and bring them back because there is hope in you. Please, dear God, my prayer for this church is that everyone here may reflect Christ and grow in your knowledge and in your image. Please, Lord, help us that we may yearn and long and desire for purity and holiness in our life. Wash us, sanctify us, and glorify us for your glory when you come in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.